Hi, everyone. Sorry. Well, that, that's digital technology for you. Um, sorry, my Vimeo crash. Let's we'll start again here. So um, welcome to Inside Innovation Live. Uh, I'm Nick Kerrigan, Head of Innovation at Swift. And in this session, we're going to be exploring blockchain and in particular, the rapid rise of blockchain technology, its evolution in recent years and some of the most cutting edge use cases now being explored in financial services. And I'm delighted today to be joined by Ricardo Correa, Global Head of Digital Currencies at R3. Ricardo, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Nick. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. So, um, Ricardo, um, can you uh, tell us a bit about yourself and your work at R3? Sure. So uh, I've been with R3 for about seven years now, coming on to seven years. It's been a hell of a journey. It's my... Uh, Third startup, a little bit of uh, background on myself. I started in payments very early, I suppose, when I was 16. I was living in Zimbabwe. And um, I, uh, I got, I got um, involved in, you know, uh, how money moves between South Africa, Zimbabwe, the UK very, very early. So it's been, it's been kind of in my DNA for a long time. So, you know, the last three years in R3 has been focused on CBDCs and stable coins and payments in particular. Um, I'll stop there for now. Great. Well, I, I know you're going to uh, provide us with some with some great insights on, on this topic, and a very warm welcome to to Inside Innovation uh, Live. Um, before we get into the discussion, um, I can see that we've got uh, two hundred and forty odd people uh, who are now with us today. Um, so feel free to ask questions on the LinkedIn live stream, and we'll endeavour to answer uh, as many of them. Uh, as, as possible. And I can see uh, lots of welcomes coming through on, on the stream. Um, so with that, Ricardo, let's start off with a, a bit of context. Um, we're talking about blockchain today. So can you start off by giving us a, a brief overview of the sort of original development of blockchain in the 2000s and its sort of its, its, its rapid rise? Sure. Well, so a little bit of a 101. So I hope the 240 odd folks on the call have a little bit of knowledge but you know just to step right back bitcoin launched in 2009 following the gfc with the promise of you know removing the intermediaries and providing a money system that was kind of uh, by the people for the people um so so what we saw then was you know a really exciting opportunity uh, of a new form of money and then in 2014 we saw the launch of ethereum um which was a slightly different approach and you know, what we saw then was the introduction of, you know, a Turing complete um, blockchain with smart contracts and really, if you like, the bifurcation of the infrastructure and the instruments on that infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, which was really exciting. And then by 2015, you know, uh, well, in 2014, Consensus uh, launched as well. In 2015, R3 uh, was founded and we were founded kind of as a consortium for banks. Um, and at the time, banks were looking at blockchain, uh, I suppose, more from a FUD perspective than a FOMO uh, perspective initially anyway. You know, could this thing disrupt uh, kind of the financial industry? So, you know, today there are many, many different types of blockchains. You know, we, we partition them mainly into permissioned and non-permissioned or public versus private. We'll dig into that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we also saw in 2019 the rise of um, you know big tech getting into the space, in particular Facebook Libra, um, announcing their project, and it was interesting to see the likes of the BIS, which is arguably kind of the central bank for central banks, kind of in March 2019, suggesting that you know CBDCs were somewhat of an interesting uh, kind of project, but nothing to be taken too seriously. Only in July for the BIS to say that, oh crap, this is probably something that should be looked at in a little bit more kind of uh, fever, a little bit uh, kind of uh, more focus should be given to it by the central banks. And today, of course, we see a large percentage of those central banks looking at blockchain, looking at uh, CBDCs and, of course, stable coins as well. Very good. Very good. So, so can you maybe go a little bit into that sort of early experimentation in regulated environments? We can see that traction, right, picking up in financial services over the over the 2010s. Um, but where do you think the, the sort of the pivots were? Hello. 
Hey, Nick, I hope sort of related. Yeah, you, you cut out for just a second. Hopefully it was just for me, but I, I get the question. So, you know, where did this start? So, listen, I'll tell you our story. Our story in 2014, the, we had 45, 50 odd commercial banks looking at, you know, what does blockchain mean? And our early experimentation in 2015 was on ledgers that were available. So looking at Bitcoin, looking at Ethereum, looking at Stellar, looking at kind of Ripple and uh, kind of all the other blockchains that were available and the solutions that were available. Um, so lots of excitement. The early projects, I remember a really cool project, Genesis. Project Genesis mm. ran over a couple of hours and it brought all the commercial banks onto Ethereum. Everyone opened up a wallet and then we were doing penny penny trades between these wallets just to understand what it really meant to kind of be on the blockchain. So, you know, fast forward nine months into that research um, and the realization, keeping in mind, Nick, that there was 50 odd commercial banks looking at this at the same time with around a thousand people uh, coming out of those institutions collectively. And the realization was, is that, you know, there was no fit for purpose blockchain for the financial mm. sector at the time. And so we started to play with a toy called Corda. And in November 2016, Corda was launched as an open source project. Um, today, Corda is at uh, 4.9, moving to 5. And we can dig into a little bit more of what Corda is and isn't. But, you know, early exploration was around, you know, what is this technology? Will it disrupt the financial uh, industry and the financial sector? Can we leverage it? How should we leverage it? What kind of use cases make sense? Arguably, we still talk about that, right? It's like, yes, is, this a good yes, uh, is that a good idea? And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But that's what we've, uh, that will, what we saw early days. Of course, what we see now is a lot more mature. A lot of the projects have gone through the basics of like, you know, is the technology viable? There's still questions around performance and privacy. We'll dig into that. Um, and then, you know, simple things like PVP, you know, domestic PVP, domestic DVP, you know, uh, settlement, security settlement is a big one. We'll talk about that as well. Um, so now we've evolved from, you know, exploring the technology, is it viable, to really looking at the use cases and understanding mm. the business behind them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's quite a, a journey, right? And, and you mentioned, Ricardo, smart contracts, right, as a, one of the key kind of uh, important developments. Um, could you sort of, before we go into the use case piece, can you demystify smart contracts for us? I mean, why, why is that an important stage and, and how have they unlocked opportunities? Yeah, um, good question. So I think the best way to describe a smart contract is, is that they are used to automate uh, kind of the code that sits on the blockchain that's used to automate kind of instructions based on triggers. So they can automate workflows, um, and they can trigger the next action based on whether conditions are met or not. Um, so, you know, smart contract is nothing more than code that executes based on triggers and then, you know, can automate workflows and can move assets and ownership from kind of wallets to wallets or nodes to nodes. Um, but hugely uh, kind of important, very um, innovative at the time, you know, when, when Bitcoin first launched, there wasn't really a notion of smart contracts, although mm -hmm. I understand that in November 2021, Bitcoin released a major upgrade called Taproot, uh, which facilitates smart contracts on the Bitcoin blockchain. But Ethereum really popularized this notion of smart mm -hmm. contracts. Um, and of course, most blockchains that you see today, including Quarter, have this notion of a smart contract. Um, and it goes further, right? So, you know, early days we were like, hey, code is law. We can get yeah. yeah. agreements <laughs> and... And then we can just execute law on the on the blockchain. Yeah, that, was, yeah. that, that didn't work out too well. So, <laughs> you know, code, certainly my my belief is code is not law. Um, and for example, in Quarta, we have this notion of attachments where we attach the legal pros to the, to the contract, um, to the smart contract. And should there be a dispute, well, you default to the attached pros, right? So, right. you know, you... Dis right, right, uh, right. Uh, dispute resolution is not on the code, but in the attached legal contract uh, of that right. smart contract. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that make that makes a, a lot of sense. And um, uh, I think you bit smart contracts have also been a bit of a, a a journey here. So so let's dive in. And, and Ricardo, you, in our preparation for this session, you gave me permission to ask some more sort of controversial questions, maybe about uh, blockchain. So so maybe let's talk a bit about strengths and weaknesses. So, um, you know, obviously, technology is never a, a silver bullet, right, to everything. Um, so, so what what use cases would you not use blockchain for, as opposed to the other way around? Yes. Yeah, so let's start with some of the strengths and weaknesses, because I think you you started there. I think today, you know, the big ones that we see is performance and scalability, mm. right? So you know, can this thing scale? We know that you know the Ethereum, of course, Ethereum with the merge is doing a hell of a lot better in terms of scalability and and performance. But arguably, performance continues to be a challenge. For me, you know, performance is um, a journey, not a destination. You continue to refine the infrastructure, refine the code, and you know, continuously improve the performance of the technology. Now, if you take blockchain into the wholesale space, you know, performance is a different question mm. and a different challenge than if you take it into the retail space, of course. But certainly performance continues to be something that, you know, has a high focus. Mm. The other is privacy. Mm. So you know, is it private? Is it anonymous when it needs to be? Mm. You know, can mm. you trust the technology when it says, hey, Nick, we're not looking at all your transactions, even if they're below 10 bucks. You know, you need to be able to believe and trust the technology to do yeah. that. Um, but where wouldn't you use it? Listen, if, you, if you're considering using it internally for internal use cases, that's probably not the right Kind of uh, kind of use case and focus. Um, if you've got trusted parties that are that are kind of involved in simple transactions and simple settlement, again, that's probably not the best use case. For us, as we look at this, it's you know use cases where you have you know many many parties that are untrusting in complex networks mm. with complex transactions that require better transparency, better reporting. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, data to be kind of um, immutable in a sense where, you know, nothing can be tampered with and you can trust that, you know, transactions and settlement has actually happened uh, as expected. So I hope that provides a little bit of an insight. Yeah, in yeah it does. It does. And, and that, that scaling question, I think, is the one that, <laughs> that is, a, is really high on people's minds, isn't it? I mean, a lot of research are around that. Is, is there things do you think we've learned in terms of, building blockchain in the right way to scale? Yeah, I mean, listen, first of all, congrats to the folks who worked on the merge. I think that was a huge undertaking, uh, but hugely successful for all accounts. Um, the merge has moved us from proof of work to proof of stake, which is mm. enormous. So proof of work, you know, lots of actors trying to solve a complex problem um versus proof of stake is a very different kind of algorithm so much 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 faster much greener you know mm. saving the planet you know not burning mm. uh, too much energy so certainly the consensus model is important to consider mm. um and then and then you've got other things so you know you've got um you've got uh horizontal versus uh vertical scaling you know uh we've learned many lessons as a result of that mm. Um, you've got peer-to-peer um, -peer protocols versus broadcast protocols. So Corda is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, meaning that only need-to-know data is shared with need-to-know nodes. So you know, so you're minimizing mm. kind of the compute cycles on the network by just sharing with need-to-know parties. Of course, that's a very different mm. technique. Um, yeah. And then you know, pluggable consensus is interesting as well. So if Nick and Ricardo are doing a transaction, we know each other, perhaps you don't need to run a whole consensus model on it versus mm -hmm. un unknowing and untrusting actors, then maybe you do need to run consensus. So, yeah. you know, all these techniques would help, I think, in the scaling uh, of blockchains. But that's very, very high level, of course, and probably best to ask kind of engineering team about what best to do and what not to do. Look, that was a great summary, and and probably I think for for the session like this, that that gives a lot of in, that gives a lot of in, insight. So, um, with that, let's go into the heart of this and talk about uh, talk about use cases. Um, 
can, let's and looking at some of the more sort of cutting edge implementations in in financial uh, in financial services. Uh, there's a lot going on in settlement uh, and in wholesale markets um, more more broadly. Can, can you tell us a, a bit about that and a bit about how you're involved in it? Yeah, absolutely. I'd suggest to you, Nick, that you know wholesale settlement using digital currency CBDCs and stablecoins is arguably one of the most exciting use cases because it makes sense. Mm, right. Mm, so, you know, mm. others you kind of look at and you squint and you really try hard to. And we're still trying to find the other use cases, predominantly in the retail space. But mm. in the wholesale space, it makes a hell of a lot of sense. I'm just going to point to a key project in the capital markets. There's a couple of them, but DTCC just recently mm. in the last several weeks announced their project ION moving from T2 to T1. Mm. I mean, that's just enormous, Nick. I mean, yeah. the amount. Yeah. Of efficiency that will gain moving from T2 to T1. And it's obviously not just the DTCC, of course, it's the mm. entire ecosystem around yes. the DTCC yeah. that needs yeah. to shift from a T2 to a T1. But what are you going to see there? So you're going to see, you know, a hell of a lot more efficiency around liquidity management. You're going to see a hell of a lot more efficiency around operations. Mm. Um, and you're going to get closer to kind of real time settlement. Uh, which, of course, is a very exciting kind of, you know, goal as mm. we edge towards kind of, you know, T0. Now, mm. I'm not sure mm. we'll ever want to get truly to T0. You mm. might want to get to T0 minus a few seconds <laughs> because of the netting issue. Yes. So, you know, yes. we've, we've, we've got to solve netting. But, um, you know, in, in, in the capital markets, certainly settlement, reducing settlement windows, reducing counterparty risk, mm. you know, increasing liquidity efficiency are just some of the kind of key opportunities that we see there. Mm. Um, in wholesale settlement, so I'll point to a couple of projects, Project Jura in particular. Oh, yes. Now nearly a year old. Gosh, I can't mm. believe how quickly 2022. <laughs> yeah, it's flown, right? You know, Jura is such a great project, you know, this, the SNB, the Swiss National Bank and the BDF, um, the French Central Bank issuing their own sovereign uh, CBDC into their own networks and then having those CBDCs available for security settlement mm. in SDX, you know, mm, the mm. exchange. So, you know, that project demonstrated how not only could the central banks issue their own sovereign money, they could retain control of that money. So the money actually doesn't leave the network. Mm. Two different yeah. models. Uh, when we talk about kind of the interoperability, you know, real time atomic settlement um, is really what we achieved in that project, which was really cool. So, you know, real time settlement of commercial paper issued by a couple of the commercial banks in Switzerland, uh, then being settled by either French sovereign money or Swiss kind of uh, francs, I think was a tremendous kind of, and that was real, real money movement, real mm. assets being issued and so on. Mm, so mm, a tremendous opportunity there. A couple of others, uh, Project Dunbar, showing yes. the multi issuance, right? So that's really cool. You know, the two projects there is MCBDC, which we've just seen some exciting news about over the last couple of weeks. Yeah. But of course, Project Dunbar, uh, you know, a multi central bank issuance platform for settlement. Um, at the wholesale end, and now that project moving, I believe, into a phase two, which will increase the number of issues within that network. So. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so much exciting stuff going on in in that in that in that space. And um, it, as you said, you know, that's that's a use case where you can see some immediate tangible benefits, right? Um, and that will, uh, you know, I'm a true, I'm a very much a believer that that those, you know, obvious benefits tend to drive innovation forward because there's then you know that you get the the business case that that sits sits behind that yeah um, and listen you know just real quick just to close off yeah. on that you know in wholesale things like privacy become mm -hmm. less important because all actors are known performance yeah. Yeah. is less of a challenge because you know you've got a much smaller network of yeah. wholesale yeah. actors yeah. You know, so large volume, low, uh, uh, yeah, so sorry, large value, low volume, yes. as opposed yes. to large volume, low value. Oh, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, the privacy performance becomes less of a thing. Um, and so, you know, that use case, again, is super exciting and certainly uh, something that we'll probably see kind of uh, in production in the next 12 to 24. Certainly, that's mm -hmm. my view. Mm -hmm.
so, so, so uh, with those projects and then some of the other ones that we're also kind of aware of, um, that there's there's quite a debate going on here about about the choice of of blockchain, as you said, permissioned versus permissionless or or, or public. Um, uh, how do you see that kind of that kind of playing out? Will will public blockchains eventually win out, or, or will we end up with a sort of you know many sort of architectures type type world? Yeah, I mean, listen, we've got you know the maximalists out there, and we know them well. Suggest that you know the only way to go is public blockchains. Mm, you know, mm. That's where everyone is. The assets are there, the liquidity is there, the wallets are there. That mm. makes a lot of sense. I mean. And, you know, my personal view is, is that perhaps that's where we need to go. Perhaps we'll get to a point where, you know, we'll have one very large, secure, governed public blockchain like the Internet, you know, just to draw kind of a mental model to. Yeah. And that kind of makes sense. You know, my, my view is, is that we need to take a few steps towards that, though. And so I can't see how we go from where we are today to you know, a big bang, now everything is kind of public and available to everybody. Mm. So it seems to me logically that, you know, we'll take steps towards that where we'll see the coexistence of private and public mm. uh, networks. Of course, that increases complexity. Interoperability mm. is key, mm. right? To unlocking that opportunity, and we know that. Um, but here's the other thought. I think, you know, you know, even though we have a public internet, there are these boiler rooms that are private. Yes. You know? where, you know, websites and pages and solutions and programs and applications are designed, developed, tested and staged, you know, in private settings mm. before they are made public. Sure. And so, you know, even if the, we get to a world where everything is public and, 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 you know, we're all able to participate, which I think is super exciting, mm. Mm. maybe there is an opportunity where, you know, the private uh, blockchains still coexist. And certainly if I look at money, you know, uh, money mm. is a public good, but before it's a public good, it's also a private opportunity where money at M0 mm. is issued into a private wholesale network, you know. And so might that still be the case? Who knows? But certainly it seems logical to me that there will be transitions towards, you know, a fully public world if we get there. Yeah. 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 Interesting. But interesting perspective. And, and absolutely. I mean, I, you know, we also view interoperability as being key in this whole space because, you know, even if we get to one sort of nirvana network, if you like, that's going to be quite a long, a long path. I guess, I guess, though, with the public kind yeah. of space, governance is a is a challenge, right? I mean, in the private blockchain or permission blockchain, the governance is kind of built in. But how do, how do you have the governance then built into the the public blockchain? Gosh, that's such a great question, especially over the last couple of weeks when we've seen tremendous kind of fallout right. around right. governance and compliance. And so, you know, I think the regulators will tell you that, you know, um, you know, even crypto is regulated. It's just not necessarily compliant or certain mm. actors are not compliant mm. against the regulation. You know, governance is an absolutely massive uh, opportunity for us to get right in the public space and even in the private space, to be honest. We're not there yet, mm. but more to be done on the public. I think things like, um, you know, there's probably two ways to think about this. One is, well, we can do, do some things on the automated technology side of, 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 of the problem in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, proof of reserves, proof of ownership, proof of balance, real-time proof of collateral, you know, yeah. these things make sense. So, you know, we can build that into the, into the technology. But also we need to consider kind of the, the more manual kind of governance where we have, you know, auditing and we have the right governance processes and models that are, that are built in as well. So mm. you want to get more automated than not, so as to not rebuild the world as we have today. Um, but, you know, uh, governance is an absolutely important and key aspect uh, for us to get to kind of a, a world of just public. Right. Right, right, yeah, that, and that makes a that makes a lot of a lot of sense. Um, I'm conscious. I'm looking at the at the stream here, and there are loads of questions coming in. So uh, I'm going to ask you one last one from me, Ricardo, and then we're going to go to the streams que sure. questions. Um, so quick fire one. Um, over the next few years, what do you think like the top three sort of transformational use cases for blockchain will be? Ooh, okay. Well, it'll have to be in capital markets, payments, and identity. So, you know, let me just give you a quick view of what that means. 
So in capital markets, you know, the continued digitization of all assets and asset classes, I think, is really exciting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the digitization of property and cars and what have you, and then the ability to trade those things in primary, secondary, and even tertiary marketplaces. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be cool. Um, you know, money. So the movement of money moving from lumpy to liquid. So, you know, today money is very lumpy, right? Mm -hmm. You get paid every month or every couple of weeks. Why mm -hmm. don't you get paid every second, right. you know? Um, and we move money cross-border, but we don't send emails cross-border. Of course, governance and legislation is different on money versus data. But still, I think that, that certainly will see a shift of money being more fluid. And then on identity, if we consider what's happening with Web3, the promise of bring your identity to the internet and the identity is yours, sovereign identity is something that I think we still need to solve. Been talking about it for a very long time, mm. but hopefully now is the time to get it right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and we could have a whole session on on identity and the the things that still need to be solved in that in right. that space. I am sure, right? Yes. Um, so let's pick up a few of the few of the the, the questions. Um, there's there's more than we can possibly get to in this session, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try and uh, extract a, a a sample of them if you like. Um, sure. So the first one came from Maurice. Maurice, thank you for your question. Um, and is about uh, smart contracts. So if you if you program a smart contract with a legal document as an attachment, who interprets that legal document, and how does that how does that actually work as a as a smart contract? Yeah, great. Thanks, Maurice. Great, great question. So you you only ever want to leave that smart the the attachment um, the attached legal prose for disputes. So the idea is is if you get to a dispute. Um, around what the smart contract has executed. How do you resolve that dispute? So there's probably a few cycles where you try to re resolve that re dispute through kind of the contract itself. Mm -hmm. But if it does get to a point where it now needs to go to um, kind of legal process, well, of course, the code's not going to do, uh, the code's not going to be enough, and therefore you now default to the attached legal document. And the legal document, you're trying to, so the, the smart contract is trying to execute against that legal contract, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. so, you know, um, eventually, if it gets to uh, kind of uh, adjudication, you want to get to the, the actual legal pros, and that's what you default to. The contract and the code eventually disappears, and now you're just looking at the legal document itself, much like what we do in the real world today. Maybe that's, again, a transition towards where mm -hmm. we'd like to get to. You know, lots of legal firms doing lots of work around mm -hmm. how codify contracts and agreements. I expect that we'll incrementally get better and better and better at that. And eventually maybe that attachment goes away. I don't know. But today okay. that's so so essentially you try mm -hmm. uh, today you try and resolve it in the code and then default to, to the, the the document if you can't. Over time more and more of that will be put into the code. You'd imagine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so uh, Shifting gear slightly, we have a question about uh, PVP and settlement. So um, Tripti, and thank you, Tripti, for your question. Uh, Tripti says, um, CLS settlements are kind of sort of PVP already. So when we talk about PVP via a blockchain as a, as a use case, what, what are we going to achieve and what benefit does that bring over, say, something like a CLS? Right. So CLS today is more on the foreign exchange. So I believe there's 18 currency pairs that are able to be executed on CLS, which is absolutely amazing. CLS has certain time windows, so it's not a 24 by 7 operation. So, you know, when we're considering PVP on blockchain, well, first of all, you're considering a couple of things. You're considering the direct payment of Ricardo to, to, to Nick. Mm -hmm. with no intermediaries, no counterparties, and it's a real-time settlement on both sides across the entire mm -hmm. structure, mm -hmm. meaning it's systemically uh, real-time settled, which is yeah. exciting. Um, doesn't necessarily need to be different currencies, could be the same currency, but on PVP, domestic PVP, you're trying to get to real-time settlement and the efficiency of kind of uh, closing the books, if you like, or settling on both sides. When you're talking about cross-border PVP with different currencies, well, here you have a bunch of interesting opportunities. First of all, you're going to increase the time window to be 24-7, mm. right? Then you're going to increase the currency pairs to be any currency to any currency. Today, the exotic currencies take, second seat, take, a, take a back seat. Very difficult to settle mm. a PVP on an 
exotic. Might mm. we introduce the likes of AMMs, you know, mm. automated market makers, in order to create these liquidity pools that would allow, you know, PVP cross border to become more viable? And so those mm. are the opportunities that we see. A great question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Very, very good. Um, and, and a sort of related question on, on CBDCs that's come in from Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. So Jonathan asks, with CBDCs emerging, what impact do you think, do you see, sorry, on retail banks? Um, and how do you see DLT technologies evolving uh, over time to support CBDCs? Oh, good question. So first of all, last question first, performance, privacy, latency, um, you know, these things need to be solved so that retail CBDC uh, is viable. Um, so, you know, we know what performance targets we need to hit. Um, and it's important also to, to, to make sure that we, we are clear that we are testing apples for apples in retail. When we say, oh, look, faster payment networks operate at this speed, and so CBDCs must be the same or higher. Mm -hmm. Of course, some faster payment notes are not real-time settled systemically across the mm -hmm. entire system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So CBDC based on token-based CBDCs, what you're trying to achieve is real-time settlement. Um, to the question around how CBDCs affect the retail banks, listen, early days we did see some models which suggested that the central bank might issue directly to Nick and Ricardo. Mm -hmm. right? so mm -hmm. a, it's not used, the commercial banks, the central bank will just issue directly. Today, we don't see that use case being very prevalent at all. In fact, the BIS strongly recommends either intermediated or hybrid, being the mm. two models that we see there, which suggests that, you know, you keep the current financial structure in place, you know, money is issued into a wholesale network, and then from the wholesale network, it's then issued into a retail network, and it's the commercial banks that continue to provide KYC, AML, CTF, right. you know, the user experience and all the things that we see today just using kind of, you know, CBDCs and token-based models as opposed to cash or, or kind of digital money. Um, so, you know, the, the shorter answer is we expect the landscape to stay more or less as it is with the retail banks, albeit that new services and new products um, will probably be uh, launched as a result. Right, right. And and Jonathan's questions was also to, to me at, at Swift. I was, but I thought I was supposed to be the interviewer rather than the answerer. But no, I, I, I will answer it, Jonathan, which is, which is um, how do we see Swift's role in this space? Well, we see Swift's role very much as ensuring interoperability uh, cross-border between different CBDC networks that we think will be designed differently and often based on different technologies. Um, and indeed, that's, that's the interlinking solution that we published our recent experiment report on. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, that question, Jonathan. Um, we're over time now, but I'm going to make room for one last question from Giraud because it's such a great question, um, and and it's uh, and it touches on on uh, climate change and net zero. So the question is, can financial services focused blockchains help banks reach net zero? Any ideas, and should this be discussed at COP27? <laughs> Whew, that's a big question as the last question, Nick. Yes. We should have had that one first. I know. But, uh, you know, there's interesting, there's interesting kind of analysis around, you know, net zero and climate change. And, you know, the, the entire payment system globally today is enormous, enormous, absolutely gigantic. And if you take the cost of running the global financial infrastructure today, um, I suppose that's a starting point. And then once we've got that view and then you start to look at, you know, what do the blockchains of today kind of burn? You know, Bitcoin, we know burns high, proof of stake, uh, sorry, proof of work versus proof of stake. You know, we're getting better on the algorithms. I think uh, as the technology kind of uh, continues to evolve and certainly with ESG and climate being kind of a first class citizen in terms of the design considerations we make, you know, it would be remiss of us to rebuild the financial infrastructure with this technology, not considering kind of how we kind of reduce the, the, the carbon footprint. So the jury's out. I mean, we would like to ensure that, yes, we will do that. But um, that's a bit, that's a road that we're, we're walking at the moment. So watch this space, I suppose, is the answer. Very good. Very good. Well, you heard it here. Watch this space from Ricardo. Um, 
Thank you, Ricardo, for, for, for joining us today on Inside Innovation Live. Um, yes. you've, been a, you've been a great guest, um, fascinating conversation. Um, that is, though, all we have, uh, all we have time for. Um, join us uh, again in December, on the 13th of December, indeed. Uh, and in that session of Inside Innovation Live, we're going to be looking back at the year in innovation, including successes, failures, and lessons learned in 2022 and maybe some predictions for 2023 as well uh, and in that session we're going to be joined by uh, a fintech superstar so watch this space for the announcement thank you everyone for for joining us today and see you again next time thanks nick thanks Thank everyone you. bye